I'm a very tired, old and worn out man And my eyes have long been blind Most things that people say to me Just seem to slip my mind Oh, but the suffering and painful times That were in years long gone Are still as clear upon my memory As the numbers on my arm What will become of all the memories Are they to scatter with the dust in the breeze Who will stand before the world Knowing what to say When the very last survivor When I hold my grandson close to me And his fingers trace the pattern of my tears He asks me, Zayda, tell me why do you cry? What is it that you fear? Oh, and I tell him there once was another child who smelled this sweet and felt this warm But he was taken from before my eyes And only I remain to mourn What will become of all the memories? Are they to scatter with the dust in the breeze? Stand before a world that now wishes to deny How will they believe in someone Never heard the cry Never heard the cries. can say you do to make things change time has a way of passing by so fast like a fleeting shadow no one will recall the faces of the past what will become of Scatter with the dust in the breeze Yet one thought gives me comfort It's all that I have left For I know that God in heaven Won't forget Good evening, everybody. Good, good, good evening, fellow neighbors and friends. I am at awe again at the great turnout we have here tonight. Our sixth Holocaust survivor speech here in Spokane. I am inspired that you showed here in such great numbers, and I'm proud of being a Spokanean. I'd like to begin this, my short remarks with thanking 
our friends and sponsors. I'd like to thank our friends in Avista, in Washington Trust Bank, the Kalispell Tribe, and Spokane BMW. Thank you so much for sponsoring tonight's event. Thank you, a special thank you to Spokane Symphony for amazing performance. And we're gonna hear from them a little bit later on. Thank you so much for Double Tree Hilton right here for hosting Eva. Thank you, Ambassador Blackstar, for chauffeuring Eva to back into from the airport. And a special thank you to Spokane Police Chief Greg Madel for offering security at tonight's event. We are very grateful for all the above, their kindness and generosity. If you could please join me, I would like to give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. And another thank you for all of you who joined us tonight. One more big round of applause. As a young adult, I was fascinated with World War II stories, and particularly, I was fascinated with the Holocaust. Every time I read one of those horrible stories, I tried to envision myself I tried to envision my family later on and tried to think, what would I do if that would happen to me? You see, because the Holocaust to me is not just a piece of history. It's a part of what happened to my people, the Jewish people, and it's quite personal. And every time you read a story about the Holocaust, I'm sure you could relate to this. I ask myself the question that I believe you all ask. How could such a horrible atrocity take place? And more importantly, the most important question how do we prevent such atrocity from ever taking place in human history? You see, Germany at that time was not a backward country. It was the center of culture and education. The people who ran this mass killing machine were educated people. You have to ask yourself, how is it that skills and skilled engineers used their skills to build gas chambers? How is it that educated physician used their education to produce mass killing machine? What happened to their education? Apparently, education is not good enough. My mentor, the Lubavitch Rebbe of blessed memory, in the 30s, he attended the Berlin University he saw and witnessed, witnessed firsthand Nazi Germany coming to power. And he believed that part of the problem and where the Holocaust came from 
was as a result of a lack of belief and principles and morals that go beyond our understanding and our intelligence. You see, the human mind is frail. The human mind can lead man astray. It could bring the most intelligent human beings to a conviction that millions of innocent men, women, and children deserve to die for the benefit of the world. Your mind alone is not good enough. Instead, the belief that every single human being was created in God's image, every single human being has a purpose and a mission that only he or she can fulfill. Not only to their family, not only to their community, but they are part of a master plan. And what they could accomplish right now, only they could accomplish it. And from the beginning of time to the end of time, the world was waiting for that person to do this specific mission that only they can accomplish. The world speaks about tolerance. I find tolerance to be an ugly word. You see, tolerance means I can't stand you but I'm gonna tolerate you because I want you to tolerate me, because I'm also a nudnik. Respect and acceptance is much greater than that. Respect means that despite your differences, I respect you. And actually, I believe we must go further than that. It's because of your differences, because you're so different, you bring something to this world that no one else can. And when these principles are founded on a higher power, that this is part of a divine master plan, and they're not available for us to mess around with those principles, I believe that we will come to a time where these type of events will never happen again. I would like to introduce one of a dear family friend who's a prominent member of the Jewish community Actually, he was our family doctor as well. And Dr. Herschel Zellman and his wife, Mary Noble, have done a lot in this community to promote the Holocaust so it's never been forgotten. I would like to ask him to come up and share a few words about the Holocaust Good evening, everyone. The Holocaust uh, was the most extensive state-planned and sponsored genocide in recorded history. Persecution of the Jews in Germany began soon after the Nazi party came to power in 1933. Immediately after the outbreak of World War II in 1939, Jews in German-occupied Poland were forcibly segregated into ghettos Soon, mobile SS death squads began the systematic killing of Jews. With the establishment of death camps like Auschwitz in 1941, the slaughtering became more efficient and continued until the liberation of the camps 
by Allied forces in 1945. By the end of World War II, the Nazis and their collaborators had exterminated six million Jews, two-thirds of the entire European Jewish population. They murdered an additional five million people who they also had deemed unsuitable for life, including Romani, communists, people with disabilities, homosexuals, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people, has a 2,000-year-old history and was not eliminated by the Allied victory over the Nazis in World War II. A white supremacist perpetrated the deadliest attack ever on an American Jewish institution one year ago in Pittsburgh. There was another deadly synagogue shooting in Poway, California last April, and a dozen more attacks were thwarted by the FBI, including the attempted bombing of a synagogue in Pueblo, Colorado by a neo-Nazi just four days ago. These acts of hate endanger not they endanger all of us, not just Jews. What do we do about these very real threats to the American Jewish community and to our American values of freedom and equality? This is what we are doing as members of the Spokane Community Observance of the Holocaust Planning Committee. We provide the opportunity for the young people of our region to learn the lessons of the Holocaust. Each year, we sponsor writing and art contests for high school and middle school students that are based on a theme from that dark time. So if you are a middle or high school student, or if you teach middle or high school students, watch for details about these contests in early December. And thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Herschel, so much. I'd like to invite our interviewer for tonight, um, Robin Nance, to join us. Uh, Robin Nance is a broadcaster in KXLY. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate that you could join us tonight, and I appreciate your enthusiasm and your making the time to join us tonight. My name is Eva Schloss. I was born in Austria, Vienna, and I'm a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz. Eva Schloss, born in 1929. She was a teenager when World War II started. She survived the Holocaust as an Auschwitz prisoner. But unfortunately, her stepsister, Anne Frank, did not. Anne Frank was an iconic character during these terrible years, and her diary remains one of the best-known published works throughout the world. Since 1985, Eva Schloss has devoted herself to Holocaust education and global peace. She has recounted her wartime experiences in more than 1,000 speaking engagements. She has written two books, and a play has been written about her life. In 1999, Eva signed the Anne Frank Peace Declaration along with United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan and the niece of Raoul Wallenberg, a legendary figure who rescued thousands of Jews in Budapest. Eva has an incredible story of survival, grit, and ultimately, an against the odds triumph, conquering the poison of bitterness, the burden of loss, with a message of tolerance and love. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Eva Schloss.
We have quite the crowd. Well, that was quite a welcome. Thank you very much. Eva, we're going to begin at the beginning. Um, I will say that one of Rabbi Han's beautiful children was backstage, and she was nine years old. And she stood about this tall, picture of health, gorgeous. Your book starts when you were about nine years old. Correct, yes, yes. Um, I was born in Austria, Vienna. It's actually a beautiful city, a lovely country. We had a very big family. The family has been already there for generations. You know, Austria used to be a big empire, the biggest empire in Europe. So people came from all those different countries to be to, in the capital if they had something to contribute. So there was um, doctors and scientists and musicians and poets. Um, so all the cultural uh, thing that was coming up in the 18th and 19th century was concentrated in Austria. And my family was part of all this. And um, I had an older brother, and um, my parents married very, very young. My mother was 18, right out of school. My father, 21. He had inherited a shoe factory from his father, but he wasn't just a manufacturer. He, um, I found in the papers, um, after the war, I found that um, a document for, from his university. He did six languages already at the time, even Dutch, which of course came in useful, at, but I never thought that anybody would just learn Dutch in Austria at the time. Um, yes, and things changed immediately when the Nazis marched in. Uninvited, there was already talk that there would be a voting if Austria wants to become um, one part with Germany, but Hitler didn't wait for the result, thinking perhaps they might not want him, but they just marched in. And at that time, already in Germany, there were already measures against Jewish people. There were no concentration camps yet, but um, the Nazis killed many Jews, and there was a concentration camp Dachau near Munich, but that was actually more for the communists, not yet for Jewish people. And um, in Austria and Germany, you had to have religious education in school. So um, the Jewish children, Austria was a very Catholic country. I think they were just Catholics and Jews. And um, so the Jewish children were called out in the, from the, their classroom, and we went into a different classroom. And we had a Jewish education, a um, little bit of Hebrew, some Jewish songs, but as well the, the holidays. And um, my pa parents were not very religious, and we children told our parents we want to light the Chabad candles, we want to do Passover. And so through the teaching of the children, the parents became again more religious. And But of course, when Hitler marched in, the Austrian population, and this is something which my parents especially, but even me as a child, couldn't understand that suddenly our friends turned against us. All those people with whom we had made excursions, who had kept to dinner with to us, um, suddenly stood in the street with the swastika flags, where they suddenly got them from, I don't know, and the Heil Hitler salute, and we Jewish people looked behind the windows, and we were very, very scared. My brother, who was 12 years old, the next day he came home from school, his clothes were torn, the blood was streaming from his face, and um, my parents questioned him, Heinz, what on earth has happened to you? And he said, my own friends did that, and the teachers just watched that it happen. My best friend was a Catholic little girl, and after school, on the way home, I usually went into plays there, but the next day after the Anschluss, meaning joining Germany, the, uh, <coughs> when, when I got to her door, the mother opened the door, and I could see she looked at me with such hatred and said, we never want to see you here again. And um, I went home crying. I said to my mother, we didn't have a quarrel. I don't understand. And my mother said, well, 
practice for Jewish people, life is going to be from now on very, very, very difficult. Is that, is that when things started changing for your family, when you started thinking you should leave? Well, my father realized it might be dangerous, and he actually, he must have I been, mean, you know, he didn't tell us, I was only eight years old. Um, he must have had already plans, and he escaped immediately to Holland, where he had a business uh, connections, and said, as soon as I found accommodation for us, I'm going to send for you. But this was really the big tragedy of the Holocaust. By 1938, many, many countries didn't want any more Jewish refugees. If you were something very important, a, a, a poet or a writer or had a lot of money, you could perhaps get out. But the ordinary poor people, there was no way that there was anywhere a home for them in the world. And that was really the big tragedy. So um, eventually we heard we could go illegally over to Belgium, which we did. So my father was in the south of Holland and we were in Brussels. Um, Belgium is a two language country, French and Flemish. Um, I was put in the class, I was nine years old at the time, put in the class and didn't understand a single word what was going on. And people, the children looked at me if I was very stupid, couldn't follow anything. And you can imagine I lost all my confidence. I became shy, I became embarrassed. And um, it was really hard. We lived in a little boarding house and um, we had, my mother had nothing to do really, you know. She had, um, she went to meet other refugees to plan perhaps we can get out of here, um, go to England or America, but uh, you know, there was really no solution. In the meantime, Hitler carried on conquering the world. This is something which is really uncomprehensive. He was a nobody really, you know, and he really had these educated people in Germany all following him. And that was really the tragedy that Germany had been um, very poor through the First World War, and Hitler promised things would get better. And what was really very important, you know, in Russia, there was the Russian Revolution, communism, and the world at that time was more afraid of communism than of the Nazis. And, you know, if countries are poor, like Austria and Germany, there were many communists. And Hitler promised he would fight the communists. And that's why the world supported Hitler. And so Poland was conquered and the Second World War had started. And my father tried desperately to get a visa for us to come as well to Amsterdam. And eventually, during the war, in February 1940, we got this visa for three months to um, visit my father in Amsterdam. And so your family then moved again after that. Yeah. Um, so um, we started to be happy again. The Dutch people were very, very friendly. I got a bicycle. I had blonde hair and blue eyes. They said, you're just like a little Dutch girl. Um, I made quite soon friends and we were very happy. My brother, he was by that time uh, 13 years old. He had a wonderful ear for music and uh, in this furnished apartment there was a piano so he started to play piano again. He got a guitar, he had an accordion, um, he became very popular with the kids so we had our house full apartment, not house. Um, in Holland you don't have houses unless in the country. You had quite small apartments and um, with modern, there was central heating, and it was, was nice. And um, as I say, it was nicely furnished, so we were really very, very happy at being together. And um, if you have no uh, uh, yards to play, the children in this neighborhood all came to play on this big open square called Navedeplein. If ever you go to Amsterdam, visit it, because it still looks the same. And as well, there is a statue to Anna Frank. 
which because is where, which is where you met her exactly uh, so one day after school um, I was playing with other children and there came a little girl and said oh you think you are new here um, and where do you come from I said from Austria so you speak German I said yes oh you must come to my apartment we came we come from Germany as well she couldn't speak German because she was four years old when the Frank family uh, um, left Germany. This was still possible at the time. And Otto, who later became my stepfather, always told me and our children the story when he saw um, that was a very well-known Nazi song, when Jewish blood drips from our knives, things is going to get better. When he heard this singing in the street, he said, that is not a country where I want to bring up a family. And so um, they left in early. So Anne didn't speak German, only Dutch. She was very um, big chatterbox. Um, she was called Mrs. Quack Quack because she could never stop talking in class. <laughs> she had to stay behind very often to write 100 lines. Um, as punishment that she talked too much in class, but she just that was she was, you know, a big chatterbox. And um, <laughs> when I told her I had an older brother, she said, when can I come and meet him? Because she was already with 11 years a big flirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you, but you, she had a cat, the family had a she cat. She had a cat, yeah. Um, well, I had my brother, and when she heard that, she said, oh, I've only a sister, and she was quite jealous of me. Um, but my brother wasn't really interested in little girl the age of his own little sister. So, um, but we were friends. We skipped together and uh, go gossiped together, and um, life seemed very good again. It seemed very good for a while. For a very little while. Very little while. Yeah. What happened to your family next? Um, because in May, so after three months, when we should have really returned back to Brussels, um, the Nazi army, the Germans, marched in and occupied Holland. That was a very short war, just uh, five days, because the war had changed drastically with the First World War, so there were the aeroplanes. And, Ho and Rotterdam, the biggest, second biggest city, was bombed with 10,000 casualties. And um, the Nazis said, if you're not going to capitulate, we are going to bomb all your cities. So that was, of course, a terrible uh, idea that, you know, they couldn't afford to lose all those many people and all the cities. So the Dutch government capitulated. But what was as well very discouraging, we had a very popular royal family, um, four little girls, and um, the royal family escaped first to uh, London and then to Canada. And you know, you had to make very quick decisions. Even royals had to make quick decisions. The Belgian king, where the Germans went after Holland, um, thought he can work better um, for his people if he stays. So he worked together with the Germans. And after the war, he had to resign because he was treated as a traitor. So, you know, any choice was a bad choice, whatever you did. And um, at first, nothing really happened. Life went on as it used to go. But sl slowly, the measures against the Jewish population started to come up. And it was not life-threatening. It was a nuisance. We were not allowed on public transport. Then we had to hand in our bicycles. We had to hand in our radio. We were not allowed to go out before 6 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock at evening. We were not allowed to go to cinemas or theaters. Um, you can live without all this. But then slowly, slowly, it became not so just a nuisance, it became dangerous. We had to wear a yellow star with Jew written on it. And by the way, all the occupied countries had that, in all, in the, all in their own languages. And it happened then that especially Jewish men and young boys started to disappear. 
Um, they were arrested and one never heard or saw them. Um, and then, which was already much more uh, dangerous in a way, we had to leave our schools and go to Jewish schools, which by itself is perfectly all right. We had Jewish teachers, but the Nazis wanted to get the young Jewish people. So they went into the schools, told the kids, we have a truck downstairs, go on it. Children had to obey, of course. And in the evening, the parents waited for the children to come home, and they didn't turn up. They went to the local police to inquire where are the kids. Didn't know. Then they even went to the German police. Again, they didn't get any answers. Those young people were never, ever seen again. Only after the war did one hear they were sent to Mauthausen, Austria, a terrible, terrible death camp where there were stone quarries and they were just thrown down from the cliffs. Mm. If ever you go to this place, um, the Dutch have a huge monument with thousands and thousands of names of all those young Dutch children who were murdered there. So <laughs> obviously things had, were escalating and your family was forced to move again. Um, after two years, um, the first year not too bad, the second year already much more difficult and afraid, um, 10,000 young people, including my brother Heinz, who was 16, and Anna's sister Margot, got a call-up notice to uh, report within a week to a certain place and to be deported to Germany to work in German factories. Well. Many parents, Otto Frank, Anna's father, and my father, and many, many other parents decided they wouldn't send their children. In Germany, the Jewish people had already been deported to death camps and ghettos. And so why would the Germans invite young Jewish people back into Germany? Very suspicious. Mm -hmm. So my father called us together and said, Heinz, you are not going. We are going to go into hiding. Well, what does it mean, hiding? I was 13 years old. I said to my father, uh, hiding, what do you mean? We play hide or seek, but you go hiding. And he explained, I find some wonderful people, um, mainly resistance workers. You know, in all the occupied countries, there was a group, many group of people who didn't want to be occupied by the Nazis, and they formed a group called the Resistance. Um, they did all kinds of things. They shot particularly by Nazis. They blew up trains. Um, they helped Jewish people to find hiding places. They printed ration cards. They uh, helped pilots had been shot down. All kinds of wonderful things, risking their own lives. Many, many of those people lost their life as well during the occupation. But anyway, uh, my father explained he couldn't find a family who can take four people. As I told you, there were only apartments which were quite small. And um, so we have to split up again. He said, I will go with my mom and uh, Heinz will go with him. And I started to cry. I didn't want to be separated. And my father explained very seriously the chance that two of us will survive is bigger when we are in two different places. So he mentioned survive. Mm -hmm. So I think this was with 13, the first time that I realized it might be a matter of life and death, which it was, of course. And you stayed, you and your mother were in so one So we home. went to one hiding place and my father and brother to a different place. So we had to separate. And if you've read the diary of Anna Frank, you know the story. They were hiding as well in Otto Frank's office. And um, there were eight people. Otto took friends in. So it was a bit different from us because they were really cut off from the world. We were living with ordinary people. And the Nazis knew that not all those young people had come to the call-up notice. So where are they? 
and they really were very particular to really catch every young Jewish person. So they made house searches. So in the night, they knocked on doors. People had to open, even um, Dutch Christian people had to open the door, let the Nazis come in, search their home. If they fancied a painting or a silver object, they just took it and they searched their houses. So we had in every hiding place a hiding place within the hiding place. Sounds peculiar, but it was. Sometimes so the people from the resistance again came, looked over their apartment and decided they would make a false partition here, sometimes in a wardrobe with a false back, uh, sometimes even under the floorboards. And so when this knock or the ring came, we quickly had to go there and hope that they wouldn't demolish a part of the apartment to find people. But we heard, for instance, a story in another home where Jewish people were hiding. Um, same thing, the Nazis came, people went into the hiding place, but the beds were still warm. They were so clever to really find everybody. So they demolished the whole apartment till they found the people. And the hosts, if they hear people like stories like that, they said, well, you know, we can't sleep, we are afraid. Um, you have to look for a different hiding place. So in those two years, we changed, um, I think it was six or seven times. And my father and brother as well. Um, they were actually, um, after those two years, they were in the country, staying with a woman, and she started to blackmail them for more money. So if you can't work, you know, all our saving had dwindled, and my father said, well, I've still got a few uh, pieces of jewelry, but no money anymore. So if the war lasts still longer, she's going to throw us out anyway. So he phoned my mother, can you please find a hiding place for us? But in 1944, it was already very difficult. Many people had been arrested, and many just didn't dare to do it anymore. So it took my mother quite a while till a Dutch nurse came forward and said she knows a safe place. And so my father and brother escaped in the early morning from this woman and um, met this nurse. She took him to a nice home, they got a nice meal. And I was, uh, I was a very active child. I missed my friends, I missed playing outside. And I was through these two years very, very miserable and depressed. And my parents decided, because where they were staying, this, this new hiding place was very near where we were staying, that we would go and visit them. And on Sunday, um, we went to, st to go where they were staying. They were very happy. They were in Amsterdam near us, and it was a nice place. And um, so we spent a few hours together, and then we went back. And on Tuesday, it was my 15th birthday. I'll never forget this day, as you can imagine. And um, we sat down to breakfast, and there was a knock on the door. Daytime was always safe and the owner opened the door, and two SS men and two Dutch policemen stormed up the stairs and went straight for us and took us away. I couldn't understand what has happened. How do they know that we were there? Um, I couldn't, it was terrible. And they marched us to the headquarters, and they separated me from my mother, and they put me in a little interrogation room, and they started firing questions at me. Um, where were you those two years? Uh, who helped you? Um, and all kind of questions. And um, I started to cry. I tell you, I was in complete shock. And I just could, I, I lost my tongue, I couldn't speak. And then they told me they were going to kill my brother if I wouldn't tell them. And then I realized that my brother and father must have been arrested as well. But, you know, I, I didn't say anything. So eventually they let me go and uh, they threw me in a little room and there was my father and brother and he explained about this nurse.
So she sold you out. She, she, and in this house, she betrayed over 200 people over the years. And after the war, my mother was actually at her court case. She only got four years. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you're in detention at this point, but you're we, with your family. We, we are, yes. Um, but the first night, we were taken to a local prison, um, women and men, of course, differently. The next day, we were taken to a holding camp. Of course, transport to the east didn't go individuals. You know, they couldn't send the train with us to, to a camp. So there were big holding camps in all the occupied countries. Um, this existed in France, Belgium, um, Greece, in all those countries where those local camps where people were assembled and when the numbers were ready for a transport, um, they were sent to the east. Holland is the most western country, so any transport would go to Germany or Poland. And that's where the terrible, terrible camps were. And at this point, you, no one knows what's going to happen, but you, your family assumes you're not getting out. You're not going home. So um, on the Friday, we were called up, and um, there were those trains, not ordinary train where you transport human beings. Um, you could call it a good, good trains, or I say like a container. Um, just metal with one sliding door. Um, there was nothing in it, but um, they put in two buckets, one for drinking water, the other one for use as a toilet. About 70 people, can you imagine, on a bucket. And there was practically no air, just a tiny little slit with a barbed wire across. And nowhere to sit, so most people had to stand. The air was terrible. Um, people fainted. The only good thing was that we were still together as a family. That was the last time that we were together. And my father, with tears in his eyes, apologized to us that from now on um, we will have to be on our own. He can't protect us anymore. That must be for a family head a very, very sad decision that the father can't look after his own family anymore. My brother, I told you, he was a wonderful um, musician, but in hiding, he had to be quiet, uh, not a sound again, he had to sit still, day in, day out, and he started to paint. And in the cattle truck, more or less the last conversation I had with him, that he told me, um, while they escaped, from that woman who blackmailed them, um, he hits a painting under the floorboard in that house with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Eric Geiger, and after the war, he's coming to pick it up again. So again, this was more or less the last thing we talked about, because he was very, very proud of his work. And as well, he wrote many, many poems, which hit as well there. Well, and then after a terrible, terrible, terrible journey, people fainted, and um, you know, we had no air, no food. Once a day, the door was slid open, and uh, big chunks of bread were thrown in, like you would feed wild animals. So eventually, the train stopped, and um, we heard shouting and a lot of dogs barking, and um, the doors were slid open. It was a beautiful May day, and um, we looked around, and we saw we were in Auschwitz. So you're there, and then they, separate, they start separating the men and the women. That was the next terrible thing. Um, if ever you have been there, or you have seen films about this horrendous, terrible place, that was a huge, huge area, many, many, many square miles um, with different camps. Auschwitz was the biggest, the main men's camp, and then there was Birkenau, which was a women's camp. That was newly constructed, just with wooden barracks, never to la last very long. 
um, Auschwitz, if ever you go there, are proper brick buildings. And um, I went much later after the war, I went there, and there were toilets were in the big buildings, and there were even tables and chairs and wardrobes in Birkenau, where we ended up, there was nothing. Just on both sides, in the middle was a passage, on both sides were three high banks, um, quite wide, about where five people can sit, but eight people had to sleep, sleep in there. There was nothing in it, no bedding, no, no bit of straw, no pillow, no blanket, nothing whatsoever. But we are not quite there yet. First, so the goodbye, you can imagine uh, uh, father and daughters and sons and mothers said goodbye, husband and wife, knowing perhaps that they will never ever see each other on earth. So you can imagine people cling to each other and cried and screamed and so until the SS came with their dogs and separated us. And then this time the train was in um, Birkenau, so the women's camp and the men had to march away to Auschwitz. It was about three miles separated. And then um, um, there was big silence and people whispered, Mengele, Mengele. He was a camp doctor. Have you ever heard that name? Um, a young German man, around 40 years old, and he was not there to help people when they were ill, but he decided who was going to live or who was going to die, meaning the first selection was taking place. So the first miracle happened. Um, you know, we were still in the clothes where we had been arrested, and my mother got in this holding camp from somebody a hat and coat. And my mother said, well, I, you wear it. Perhaps, perhaps it comes handy in one day. Um, we really thought we were going to be killed, but you know, you don't think about that. You think there might perhaps be a future. So I wore it. And then came this Mengele. He looked at you fraction of a second, but really he didn't just um, and decided this side or this side, life or death. There were no children in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau. If a mother held a toddler by the hand, she had to give it to an older woman who took the child and went the wrong direction. The mother wanted to run after her child. No, you stay here. So um, we lost, at this first selection, about half our transport. Of course, we didn't, re we didn't really know what has happened to those people, but we realized it must be terrible because those were people who were not really able to work. So, and then um, the rest was herded into a big, big barrack, and the next command was undressed completely naked. And the young SS people were walking around there, poking with their guns on us. And, you know, we were terribly embarrassed, of course, um, standing there naked, shivering. It was hot, but we were still shivering. Then we had to pass in front of a large, large table where people were sitting with um, big file books. And we had to we were interrogated where you came from, what country, how old are you, what profession have you, on and on and on and on. And then they told us, from now on, you're not a human being, you're like a cattle who is going to um, stamp with a number, um, tattooed actually. And, um, and if ever we need you or want you, you're going to be called out by your number. Forget you have a name. So very, very degradation. The next thing, all our hair was shaved. And then um, we walked out still naked and there was huge heaps of clothes and another heap of shoes and we were thrown one garment and two pair, two shoes, which of course never was a pair. Um, could be two right boots or a sandal and a, and a boot. And, the, uh, and what you wore as a dress could be a dress, could a winter coat, could even be a night dress. And then we were herded into those barracks, um, which 
We had to climb in or be underneath, which was not high enough. You had to sit like that. And um, they told us, this is where you're going to stay as long as you live, which isn't very long anyway. But in those uh, wood, there were bed bugs and lice. So within days, we were already scratching and itchy and full of sores. And um, we had to go to work from early morning to late at night. In the morning, we got a little mug of liquid. In the evening, we got a chunk of bread. And this had to last you till the next evening, where people wanted to uh, keep something for daytime, but you had nowhere to keep anything. Um, you know, there was not a cupboard or behind, there was just nothing. And um, so the only thing was you put it under your head when you slept. But it happened not in the beginning, but later, and this was really a big tragedy, you know? People didn't help each other anymore. And that was part of the degradation that they wouldn't, you know, we were all decent human beings who helped each other, community people. But from then on, when you realized if you don't eat, you starve, you looked really only after yourself. So it happened very often that you slept on that piece of bread, half of it to have something for the day, that it was gone because the person who slept next to you ate it away uh, where you slept. So um, this is how life was every day. I saw some questions which you had given in. Uh, what did you do? Um, you worked from early morning to late at night, and then when you came back very, very tired, you had to stand again for two hours in front of your barrack, and the whole camp was counted. Very often, somebody had died, and so the number didn't tally, so the camp had to be re recounted, which takes up to four hours. So we got to bed perhaps at midnight, and at five o'clock we had again to get up and stand again outside. In the summer, our ears got burned. In the winter, with one garment, we froze to death, standing still there. Um, terrible, terrible conditions. So very often you woke up and the person next to you didn't make it. And there was so much cruelty by the camp, by the guards. Um, you were even singled out. Um, well, I was at that time, at, um, when we got there, then in June, there were the Hungarian Jews were captured, and there came every day, there came thousands of those young people. And, you know, as I said, everything that you brought along was taken away, and that was taken to a place that was nicknamed Canada, meaning plenty and the good life. Well, it wasn't plenty and it wasn't good life, but it was slightly better because there you had to uh, sort out the belongings of the people who had come. And we, uh, one of my jobs was to, op to open the hems of garments because many, many people had hidden jewelry or money or uh, other valuables there, um, thinking perhaps they can bribe themselves out. So I had to do this and then hand it over to the Nazis. And that was, of course, not a very difficult work, not so bad, and you found food as well. So I did this for three weeks till those transports stopped. And then we went back to ordinary work. And washing was something which practically never happened. Um, so, as I say, we were full of lice, but once a week there was a shower and you were deloused. And I will tell now that terrible story. Um, so one day we went as well to a shower and we came out of it, naked of course still, and there stood Mengele um, and the selection was taking place. Meaning we had to naked turn around in front of him and he would decide if we were still able to work or if we were going to be guests. And I passed, and my mother followed me, and like any mother would do, she had very often given me 
some of her bread ration. And she, a busted bitch, she didn't look very well. But nevertheless, so she turned it around to Mengele and he decided she wasn't fit for work anymore. So 40 of our Dutch uh, transport, because we were kept together, um, were marched out naked to go to the gas chambers. I still tried to run after her to say goodbye, but I was beaten um, by SS um, and separated. Not even that did they allow. So, and then we moved to a different part of the camp and I thought I'd lost my mother. You can imagine this was for me really the hardest time. It could have been perhaps, um, it had become already slightly colder, perhaps October. And um, so it became winter, it became very, very, very cold. It was one of the coldest winter on records. And um, I was on the point of giving up. Um, I had frostbite on my feet, um, had open wounds. Um, once when I was in my bunk, um, you know, I had no blanket. I was just like, covering myself a bit with a rag which I had. My, my foot was sticking out and there were open toes and a rat came and gnawed on my toes. Um, you know, it was, ter it was so terrible. And, um, I had lost my mother. I didn't know if my father or my brother was alive. And I thought, I, I can't, can't hold on much longer. And um, the next day I was sitting to work. It um, was a very, very heavy work. I won't explain it to you now. But if you didn't do what you had to do, um, you were killed as well. So uh, we were very anxious doing what we had to do. And um, I was called out by a couple couple were Polish, usually criminals, who really ran the camps under the Nazi supervision. The Nazis just supervised, but the couples were really the people who were particularly cruel to us. So a couple called me and said, you are wanted outside. And I thought, well, now that's it. The end. But I must say, you know, I was not even that worried because I thought I can't make it anyway much longer. So, um, and I go outside and there were two men standing, an SS man, and the other one was my father. Unbelievable. You know, how he knew where I was, how he could get this SS man to bring him to me, um, I will never know. It's, a miracle, I can't describe it any different. Of course, we fell in his other arms and he told me that Heinz was okay still. And then the question, where is Mutti, my mom? And I burst into tears and I told my father she had been selected. Well, I saw my father nearly collapse in front of my eyes. This strong man who was always you know, always full of sport and ideas and this wonderful man was reused, reduced to a crying little person. And, um, but he got his self, his uh, character back and he said to me, hold on, David, yeah, hold on. The war is soon finished, we'll be together again and Muti will protect you, you will see, you'll be all right. And I still saw him once and then I never saw him anymore. And then the Germans realized the Russians were approaching. That might have been already December by then. And um, <clears throat> and it um, was very, very, very cold. And um, they took every day, they went into barracks and told the people to leave everything there and just come and march and leave the camp. And they marched those people in the middle of winter, badly closed, practically not fed, um, into Germany and Austria. Those were called, after the war, the death marches. Have you heard of that? Mm, yes. Yeah, because you can imagine most people perished. And um, Birkenau as well, the barracks became empty, many, many guards 
uh, left as well, ran away, went home probably, and um, was not so strict anymore. Sometimes we didn't go to work at all. Um, some of the gates, you know, was A, B, C, uh, camp, many, many different gates. The gates were sometimes open, and people from other gate, other camps came to see other people, if they could find people they knew, or things like that. And one day, um, I saw some Dutch people from our transport coming towards me, and they said, we have seen your mother. And I said, well, thank you, thank you, but I, I know she has been killed. Um, they just wanted to cheer me up. They said, no, 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 really, she is there um, in this and this part of the camp. Try to get there, and you will see she is there. Well, I didn't believe it, of course, but nevertheless, I tried to go there, which I succeeded after a few days, and um, indeed, I found my mother. So this, again, you know, was amazing, amazing, amazing. And she explained to me what had happened, and so we stayed together, and it must have gone January by now, and the Germans, again, must have been very, very nervous because the Russians were very near. And one morning we woke up and the camp was completely deserted. All the Nazis had gone, um, but taking most of the inmates still with them. That's another quite long story, how my mother and me didn't go. Because that's actually quite controversial to have stayed in Auschwitz, saved our lives. And you should read her. I will push the book so much because um, there's so many more details on, in every piece of this, this story. It's yeah, so unreal. So that you've talked about at least three miracles that seemed like miracles that have happened to, to your family. And, and, um, but the great thing is her mom writes a couple of the chapters in this book and um, it really fills in a lot of holes. It's just fabulous. So, so the, the camp, kind of cleared out. It was kind of deserted. I think there were perhaps five, 500 women left. And um, the gates, the proper gates to the outside were open. We could have left, but we were much too weak. It was too cold. And uh, some Polish people who knew perhaps the area or the relatives somewhere did go, but we stayed hoping the Russians would come soon. And indeed, after a few days, um, I walked around again. I tried to find some food. And um, there is at the gate a huge creature, um, all furs and icicles. And from the distance, I thought it was a bear. But when I looked closer, I realized it was a man. It was a Russian soldier. And you know, there were those big fur hats <laughs> and, um, and, and fur, fur coats because the cold was terrible. And um, he came in, um, of course, I couldn't speak to him, but some Polish people who were still there could speak to him. And he explained he was a scout, a forerunner. Before the army was coming, he had to report if the army has to fight or if she could just advance. So he looked, there were no Nazis around, so he said he was going to report back that they will come. So he said, in a few days they will come and they will look after you. And indeed, in a few days they came with horses, with field kitchen, with, with uh, guns and trucks and all their gear to pursuing the Nazis. But they stayed the night and they cooked their own for themselves, but as well for us, some wonderful cabbage soup. And um, the smell already, food, food, food. You know, we were obsessed with food. Um, and so they gave us in those big uh, metal bowls, lots of slots, and uh, greasy, greasy soup. And we just ate and ate and ate and ate. But I've never spent a more painful night on a bucket. <laughs> Because I, the food went straight yeah. through you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I think to put into perspective what you, you're, you were starving, you were, you were literally starving to death. Of course. What, how, do you have any idea how 
much you weighed or, well, no weight, no, but we were, um, when I went to see my mother, when I found her, I had at that time a very heavy coat, nothing underneath but a coat, and so I looked actually quite solid, but my mother wanted to see me, yeah. so she opened this coat and she started to cry because I was like a skeleton. You know, if you don't get food, you just, that's it. That's it. And so, so you're, you were so malnourished and starving, and, um, yeah, and then you had food. Had it, but they had to leave again because the war was going on. So that was January 27, the liberation of Auschwitz. And this next year is at the 75th anniversary, and I know there's already a lot of preparation of special things going to happen. Um, in England, I don't know if you do this here as well. And, um, but then the Russians left and we were left again on our own. And I decided with another French girl, we would go to the men's camp to Auschwitz to see if we could find our men, um, just my, my father and brother. So we went there and um, she stayed there. I never saw her anymore, but um, I looked around everywhere and I saw a man who looked slightly familiar, but he was very, very thin and um, it's very sad looking. And, um, but there was something familiar. And I went to him and I said, I think I've met you. He said, yes, I'm Otto Frank, Anne's, Anne's uh, father. And uh, I said, have you seen my father or brother? He said, yes, but they left with the Germans. So at that time, I thought, well, that's good news. And he asked me, of course, if I'd seen his family, but I hadn't seen them. They were betrayed as well um, in August, and, but they were deported in September. Their transport to Auschwitz was the very last one who went to Auschwitz from Holland. And um, so Otto was in the men camp and his wife and the girls in the women's camp but I never saw them. And um, <coughs> so I went to fetch my mother and we decided we would stay in Auschwitz because as I told you, the barracks were more solid, there were toilets and everything. So we went there, but there was fierce, fierce fighting in Poland. And um, once even the Germans came back and the Russians decided they wouldn't leave us there, they would take us eastward. We couldn't go back to the west, of course, the war was still going on. So we went eastward with the Russians, they looked after us, and I want to stress that there was no raping of us, and they fed us, they closed us, they gave us even Russian uniforms, and they kept us safe. And we traveled, the army was always going towards the front, and we were traveling the other direction. So it took a long, long time. We traveled till May, this from end of January till May, we were always on the road um, till we ended up in Odessa, which is on the Black Sea. Um, now it's Ukraine, but at the time it was Russia. And there we waited for the end of the war. And when that came, we realized we had survived. And Otto Frank was with us as well. But then we had to get back to the West. That was another long, long journey. In my book is a map. You can see this um, amazing journey which we did without really having anything, you know, still like popers. And, um, but then a New Zealand troop transport ship came and transported us um, back to the west. So we wanted to get out in Turkey, in Istanbul, to get back to the north but the Turks didn't want us. We said, they said, you, are, you might have lice still and uh, cholera, perhaps illness. And then they wanted to drop us in Geneva, in Genoa, in um, Italy. They didn't want us either. Uh, then we went to Marseille and the French welcomed us. So, uh, because there were as well French prisoners of war with us. So, and then we had again a long journey back to Holland. So, and we ended up in Amsterdam in June uh, 1945. So it was a long, long journey. And um, still with nothing, you know, we had a little 
little fruit of belongings which he collected, but we were really penniless and nothing. And, um, but we were lucky, and this is very, very important, we were able to get back to our apartment because I told you it was a furnished apartment because we hadn't brought anything. And um, the woman who owned it let us back in there. But Otto and many, many other people who came back had nowhere to go because other people had moved into the apartment and the furniture, all the goods were taken from Jewish apartment, were shipped to Germany to help the bombed cities. So Otto had to stay with Meep Gies, who was the lady, one of the ladies in the house who helped hide them. And then we waited for news. We went to the station every day. We put an advert in the paper um, um, asking people, have you been in the cab? Where were you? Have you seen this person? And so on. And we didn't hear anything. And Otto one day met people who had been in Anne Frank and the sister had been taken out of Auschwitz and were taken to another camp in Germany, Bergen-Belsen, and um, they perished there in April. And um, those women were there when they saw the girls die. So Otto knew. And he came to tell us this terrible, terrible news. And after he left, my mother said, how can this man carry on? He was 57 years old. How can he carry on with his life? He has nothing to live for. And um, then a few days later, he came again with a little parcel under his arm, and he opened it very careful. And I'm sure you know what it was. It was, a it was a diary. And he said, can I read you a little bit from it? And I said, of course, and he opened it um, as if it was, you know, uh, the most treasured thing in the world. And he read a few lines, but he always burst into tears. It was too emotional. It took him three weeks to read it. And um, then we got a letter from the Red Cross, very, uh, not, not nice letter, just very factual typed said, we have to tell to my mother, we have to tell you that your husband with name, Eric Geiger, with his birthday dates, and your son, Heinz Geiger, born so and so, perished in Mauthausen, this terrible stone quarry camp, several days before the American army came to liberate that camp. Well, that was the last straw. You know, I had always survived because I assumed we would be a family together again. But when I realized that can never ever happen, I became very, very depressed. And, um, and I hated everybody, not just the Nazis, but everybody. Because as I explained before, you know, if we could have been able to get to England or to America, we would all be alive still. And, um, so Otto came very often to our house and um, helped my mother. My mother had to make a living. Uh, and she wrote to her mother. Her, her, her grandparents were able to get to England. So it's well a long story. And um, she wrote to her mother. Um, I have to be either her, the mother, her father, and the brother, and I can't call myself to be a widow. I have lost her husband, my husband, and my son. So we were both very, very miserable, very sad, felt we couldn't cope with this disaster. But we didn't talk, you know, we didn't support each other, we didn't talk about how bad we felt, how miserable, how sad we were. We pretended we can manage, but we couldn't manage. And um, when I finished school, Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer. And um, I didn't really care. And um, <coughs> I was still very miserable in Amsterdam. I couldn't make friends, you know. And um, Otto had knew somebody in London who had a photographic studio. And he got me a job there for um, apprentice. So I went to London for just for one year in 1951 and um, I lived in a little boarding house 
uh, well, from a Czech woman who had a few other lodges to earn a living. And there was a young man who had come from Israel to study economics. And um, we both didn't earn much money, three pounds a week. We had to pay our fare, our food, our, our lodging. And uh, so we went for long walks. And after six months, he said to me, if I fall in love with you, will you marry me? And um, when, when I've finished with my study, we can start a new life and go to Israel. And I said to him, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he was quite in shock. He said, why not? And I had never, you know, I never told him I'd been in a camp. I didn't tell him uh, I'd lost my family. Uh, you know, I was just an apprentice, and he told me uh, he was an Israeli, which he wasn't. He was still a German refugee, and I told him I was Dutch, which I wasn't, because <laughs> we, we, you know, we lost our passports. We were stateless. It took a long time till we were able to get a nationality back again. And um, so traveling was difficult. My grandmother, for instance, was not allowed to visit us because we were foreign, Austrian, German enemies, you know. It was really very, very strict for many, many years. So it was really difficult. But Otto came to visit me one day. He too, he had to be, uh, uh, he was a foreign alien, an uh, enemy. He had to prove that he was not a German Nazi, but a Jew refugee. It uh, was really very, very difficult and strict. But he said, um, at that time, in the 50s, he had already, he got a Dutch passport, and um, he came to be, keep an eye on me, and I told him this young man had asked me to marry him, but of course I said no, because I'm going back to my mother. I was very close to my mother. I couldn't imagine I would just desert her. And um, and so Otto got a little bit embarrassed, and he said, well, while you were away, we fell in love as well, and when you get settled, we like to get married. So I went back to this young man and said, well, you can marry me now. <laughs> <laughs> which, which we did. We went to Amsterdam, because we didn't know anybody in England, and got married, and a year later, uh, Otto and my mother got married, and they were married for 27 years, longer than they were married with their first partners. And um, I've never seen a happier uh, couple. They really understood each other. They worked together, well, mainly with the uh, publication of the diaries in many, many languages, over 70 languages. They made the contracts. They saw the about uh, tra uh, um, tra um, uh, how do you say, tradui, uh, uh, fat, I know the Dutch word, fataling, tra translations, translations. And you know, they really work together. And they got thousands and thousands of fan letters from, very often from girls who had read the diary and wanted to know more and wanted to be adopted by Otto and all <laughs> kinds of things, you know. And so they had really still a very, very rich life. And I was married uh, 63 years with my husband. Um, when I tell that in schools, uh, they said, how many husbands? I said, just one. And <laughs> they, they can't believe that. And um, we have got three daughters and five grandchildren. And the whole family lives in England. Okay. And they are really British. I think, Rabbi, do you have questions that, from the audience? <laughs> of course I didn't bring my glasses out here. You sent in some <laughs> questions, but of course we can't answer everything. So um, we picked a few and um, we will see okay. if I can answer them properly. One of the questions from the audience says, have you been able to forgive the Nazis, or do you feel like you have been bitter your whole life? Um, as I explained to you, I was bitter for many, many years. Even when I heard speaking German, which was really my mother tongue, 
I got uh, creeps. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't, wouldn't go to Germany, and uh, it was really, really hard. And I haven't forgiven for many, many, many years. But if you have so much, and Otto explained to me, if you hate so much, the people you hate, they don't suffer, but you become miserable. And I was miserable. So um, eventually, um, after many, many years, I uh, was invited by Germany to speak in a school, and I went there very reluctantly. But the young people were so ashamed, so sorry about what has happened. And um, then I realized those people had really nothing to do with it. They were innocent. So I realized I have no hatred against the German people as such, and I have forgiven. And you know, Israel wouldn't be the land if it is, not, it is now, because Germany has accepted their guilt. They've paid a lot of, I mean, you can't pay money for lost life, but nevertheless, they've helped people. They have accepted the guilt. And, um, you know, what is done is done, but they try to make up. As well, you know that the Mer uh, Angela Merkel is the only country in the world who took a million refugees. That is part of the guilt feeling. And um, so also I realized we can't carry on. I was once picked up in Chicago and had to drive to um, Minnesota, I think, or somewhere. And they said, do you mind if the person who picks you up drives a, drives a Mercedes? And I said, no, you know, I mean, um, there are people who would never set foot in Germany, the people who would never buy um, German products, but I think that is wrong. But the Nazis, those people, um, I don't know if you've heard the Wannsee Conference. That was um, in 1940, the Nazi leaders like um, Mengele and Hearst and Hitler and Goebbels and Goering and Eichmann sat together um, at a lake having a big dinner and smoking and drinking to decide the quickest, cheapest uh, way um, to kill a whole people. And they decided um, that wouldn't need a bullet, it wouldn't need a soldier to kill it with guessing people. Those people I have never forgiven and never will forgive, and I hope the bird in hell, if that exists. Amen. Another question from the audience. How have your experiences affected your view of people? Do you feel like people are generally good or bad? Is it hard for you to meet new people wondering how they will treat you? Say again, I didn't quite. <laughs> There's three questions yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Let's start, we'll start with the first one. How have your experiences affected your view of people? Said I. Do you, have you, your experiences affected how you view people? Um, well, as I say, uh, I'm 90 years old, so I've changed my attitude over the years very, very often. Um, at first, as I say, I hated everybody, not only the Germans. Then later, I started to hate only certain bad people. But, you know, in my life, I must say, I've experienced some wonderful, wonderful people. And um, even now, still, when I go and travel like this, uh, I've made many, many friends in America, people who are interested, or the people who are studying the Holocaust, people who want to learn from it, who do good things. So um, there are some wonderful people around. And, you know, yes, there are bad people and good people. And, um, um, you know, I, I'm actually a very happy person. And as well, I've got five grandchildren who are all very wonderful people, all working for the good of mankind, um, volunteering for all kinds of helping, soup kitchen at Christmas and things like that. You know, there's a lot of wonderful things happening. Unfortunately, the news doesn't show that. Mm. That is another thing. We don't want to hear only the bad things that people do. We want to hear as well the good people. And, um, you know, so I'm not bitter. I know this was a small part of my life, but of course, I will always regret what has happened and the, that I'm 
lost my family. This is something I will never ever forget. And especially this young brother, this wonderful, talented young man, when Otto got the diary, I went to pick up the artworks, the paintings, which I was amazed to find. And um, my second book I wrote, The Promise, is a book about Heinz, about his life, because, you know, I just tell a, lot, a little story. When Heinz was 12 years old, he was very much afraid of dying, being so a sensitive, artistic young man. And um, so one night he asked me, what will happen when we die, I'm afraid. And I said, well, I don't know, let's ask our father who has answers to everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went and he said, Papi, what will happen when I die? And my father said, well, yes, of course, everybody has to die. Your body will integrate, but if you have children, you will live on in your children. And then this 12-year-old boy said, but what if I die before I have any children? And my father thought for a little bit and said, he said, nothing gets lost. We go from generation to generation. We are a big chain and we are all a link in this chain. And even if you had a short life, whatever you have done in this short life, somebody will be remembered and you will never be forgotten. So this is really what we all aim. And um, so I wrote this book about Heinz. I donated the paintings, about 30 paintings, to the Resistance Museum in Amsterdam. If ever you go to Amsterdam, have a look there. Um, we have a traveling exhibition of this, his artwork and his poems. And um, there's a friend who's writing a book about him now, so that he won't be forgotten. So um, this is, you know, and this is why I, um, don't hate people. Uh, I give everybody a chance to be a, a decent person. And Eva, you tell your story all over and you ha have more than a thousand times. Why is it so important for us to hear the story and for the young people in the audience to know what you've been through? Because I think something like this, like the Holocaust, has never ever happened. And you know, nowadays, unfortunately, there is again prejudice, and especially, which I really can't understand, religious prejudice. Muslims kill Muslims, um, Buddhists kill Muslims, uh, Christians are being killed, Jewish people are attacked as well. There is again anti-Semitism. Um, and, you know, religion is something uplifting, it is something very personal, and basically all religion wants the same thing. So why can't we live in harmony with each other and accept each other, even if we have a different religion? And as well, we are all human beings. If we have a different skin color, um, nobody is better than another person. And this is what I try to make young people to understand. And young people, um, you know, in a nursery, the children will not even realize the child is different. So it is only when you get older, you suddenly think, oh, this, the parents tell a child, oh, don't bring this child back home, you know? And this is something we have to learn to accept each other for the person we are and not for the color which we have or for the religion we have and then we will have a more harmonious, peaceful, happier world. We are so honored that you are here and spent your time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you so much, Eva. Before we conclude our program tonight, I would like to firstly thank Eve. Please wait. Please don't leave. If you could stay for a few more minutes till the end of the program, we would really appreciate it.
Thank you so much, Eve, for an incredible, inspiring story. Thank you, Robin, so much for a great job. We really appreciate it. Um, there will be books available for sale. If I can ask all the volunteers that are here, please remain and help us help as many of you get a signed book. There's only a limited amount. There have been some issues. Um, and if you did buy a book, make sure to pick up the book tonight. You could show a receipt and pick up a book. They will not be available once they're sold out. They're actually out of print. And if you don't pick one out tonight, we can't get it to you. In previous events, I still have books from every event with signed names inside. So please pick up your book. One more request I ask of you, there's a lot of work that goes into making these events. And we'd like to continue to bring survivors here to Spokane because we believe that there are stories based upon my feedback and your stories, they inspire you. And I took upon myself a commitment to bring survivors to Spokane while we can. And in order to continue to do that and to improve what we do, I need your feedback. When you came inside, I hope you got a little card. You could give it to one of our volunteers if you don't find them. There are little round tables. As soon as you come in, put them on the round tables, and our volunteers will pick them up. Tomorrow, I'm going to be sending out a survey. In fact, um, it's on the link when we were coming on the screen. And please fill it out. In, in order to encourage people to fill it out, we will raffle off $100. OK, we'll continue with our program. Dark clouds began to cover the skies of Europe, the clouds of Nazism. And as they invaded Warsaw, they moved Jews, men, women, and children into the ghettos. Slowly, over time, the ghettos began to empty. Even the birds stopped singing, as if they knew what came next. The trains of doom filled with the innocent and the pure, carrying them to their deaths. And it was on one such train headed to the death camp Treblinka, in the midst of the terror, the gasping, the weeping, and the despair, that a lone voice was heard singing. His name was Azriel David Fasting, the cantor of the saintly Moznitsa Rebbe, Rabbi Shaul Yedidja Elisar. People thought he had lost his mind, but Azriel's heavenly and sweet voice continued its soulful tune. There he was, face aglow, eyes squeezed tight with concentration, fixated upon the words of one of the 13 principles of the Jewish faith, Ani Ma'amin, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Moshiach, the final redemption. Gradually, the hundreds of listening ears joined his song, at first quietly, but slowly growing louder and louder. Soon the song spread from car to car, and every mouth that could still draw a breath joined in Azriel's haunting melody, Anima Amin. His eyes red from crying and his cheeks wet with tears. Cantor Fostig tore a piece off of his own shirt and jotted down the notes of his new composition. There, he proclaimed, I will give half my share in the world to come to the person who will take my song to my saintly teacher, the Moznitsa Rebbe, who had escaped to the shores of the United States. A hushed silence descended upon the train, and two young men appeared, promising to bring the song to the Rebbe at any cost. Bidding farewell to their brothers and sisters, they jumped out of a hole they broke in the train's roof. One miraculously survived, and clutching dearly to the shirt, kept the melody alive. It 
was on Yom Kippur, just after the war, on the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. And the Mosnitzer Rebbe's synagogue in New York was filled with thousands upon thousands. As the Rebbe began singing the Thank you so much. What a wonderful rendition of Ani Ma'amin. I'm absolutely touched. While one cannot control what occurs to him, we could always choose how we react to what life throws at us. This song, Ani Ma'amin, which was composed, and the person who brought this composition, actually his grandson is my friend. He's my father's boss, but he's also a supporter of Chabad of Spokane. Was composed in the darkest moment of humanity. And one of the things that inspires people the most when they meet people like you, Eve, Eva, and other survivors is that despite whatever you went through, you persevered. You could smile. You could laugh. 
You could trust a room full of strangers with your personal story. And my takeaway from an event like tonight, and what I think what we can all take from tonight, is a personal inspiration that no matter what happens, there is always hope. I believe with complete faith in the coming of Mashiach, which is what we just sang. And this was sung in the darkest moment, is that we always have hope. There is always, if today is a dark day, there is always a brighter day tomorrow. And that is the message that I see in Holocaust survivors. And I don't like the title Holocaust survivors. I believe they embody, they personify what human beings should look like. Thank you so much, Eva, for joining us. Everyone, please give Eva a big round of applause. Thank you everyone so much and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Please remember, to, there are a few books left again. If you'd like a signed book, meet any one of our volunteers. You could go to our website, jewishspokane.com slash forward book and buy, just show a receipt and you could pick up your book. There, there will not be book signing. Please sign those cards and fill out that survey. Don't forget. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.